some ways, I'm glad the 80 Olympia turned out the way it did. It brought into clear focus for me really what the political establishment and bodybuilding is really all about. For years, I was walking around in a fool's paradise. I thought everyone was as nice a guy as I was. I thought that evil was something you just read about in novels and newspapers. When in fact, evil was something that's around all of us. This brought it all into focus, and I didn't want to be involved or associated with people like that and decided to drop out. There was a, a rift after the 80 Olympia. Actually, it, it wasn't so much Joe as Ben. There was one time when I was in the office and a phone call came in from Ben Weider for me. During the course of the conversation, I can remember yelling at Ben. He was not appreciating some of the things that I was saying about the ISBB with regard to the 80 Olympia. And uh, I remember Joe grabbed the phone. Why are you yelling at my brother like that? And Joe took, took the phone and talked to Ben. And I can only surmise what Ben said, but whatever it was, Joe's response was that I was standing there. What do you want me to do, Ben? Put a muscle on the guy? I was talking a lot. I was saying a lot of things that Ben didn't like. I suspect at one point Ben got very irritated and told Joe to cool it with Mike Spencer and, and there was cooling after a while. I was actually driving myself into the ground in addition to my training. I was writing articles, doing a lot of reading and studying, doing seminars and exhibitions. And then that's what led to my taking amphetamine. In 1979, I started getting amphetamines from a doctor, not for the purpose of getting high, that was the furthest thing from my mind. I didn't like getting high, as a matter of fact, I had stopped smoking marijuana many years before. I was taking amphetamines as ergogenic games. I, I loved being productive. I would wake up every morning at 4 o'clock and read literature, philosophy for a couple, three hours, go to the gym. After that, come home and write an article, go back down to the sea and ride bike for 40 miles, come home, take a nap, go back down to the beach area and run three to six miles, then come home, pose, do some more study, answer phone calls, do some business with a mail order. But I didn't realize that I had lost sight of the fact that the body and mind has much space. I was, I, I was in love with being conscious. Amphetamines have that effect on a lot of people. I had read some of the literature on it, so I had never heard of any long-term physical damage, but I did know that it could possibly result in acute episodes of psychosis. I had studied that years ago as part of my interest in the mind in psychiatry, but I was convinced that I was focused enough. I was convinced that my energy were being channeled in the positive direction, and they were. I don't think there's anything wrong with working as hard as I did as long as you don't have to take stimulants in order to do it. A lot of people drink a lot of coffee every day and smoke cigarettes. They do whatever they can to stay stimulated and be productive. In 1983, I left Los Angeles, where I worked for Joe Weider and his Muscle and Fitness magazine, to go to Florida to work for Arthur Jones at Nautilus. I stayed there for a relatively short period, only six months, uh, which is quite interesting, actually. A year or two prior to that, I said to an old friend of mine, I wouldn't mind working for Arthur Jones, if only for six months, to get to see how his mind works. As it turned out, it was only six months, and I left his employ. Went to Europe, performed numerous exhibitions and seminars, came back for a short period, Actually, a year and a half, I published and served as editor of my own magazine, Workout for Fitness, which was a more general fitness magazine, soft core bodybuilding magazine, as I called it. It became the central focus of my life for a year and a half. I worked harder than perhaps I'd ever worked in my life, sometimes staying awake two or three days at a time to be production scheduled. I think in our 12th issue, right in the middle of it, and I got a phone call one day that no more money was going to be given to Workout Magazine. I was left high and dry.
at that point I was taking a lot of amphetamine and that on top of everything that happened that left me emotionally distraught did something to my mind that I'm fairly clear about today, although these things are very, very complex. The combination of being emotionally distraught, which can cause an individual to lose conceptual control, combined with amphetamines, did something to my emotional structure that led to my performing a number of irrational acts that got me institutionalized. On different occasions for up to three months, There was something going on in my subconscious. At that time, I did not understand the importance of philosophical consistency. Uh, there were a number of contradictions working in my soul, and I didn't understand the nature of them. And the negative parts took hold. I was not being life-affirming. At one point, I had ceased to care. I was suicidal a couple of times. Because I had nothing that I valued strongly enough. There was no forward direction. It was literally a day-to-day -day existence. There were periods of lucidity. For a while, I would be, be, be pursuing something in my mind, and I was convinced it was real. I would get institutionalized for it, but I'd be released to think, well, I'm right, they're wrong. I'm gonna continue doing it, even if it gets me in trouble. I was convinced I was right. I was not in full conceptual control. Actually, the only person that was, why should they, actually John Little was quite supportive. He was one of the only two or three people who didn't approach me on the ignorant assumption that I was just literally a psychotic, not knowing what the term meant, therefore writing me off as not worthy of consideration. John understands quite a bit about the power of ideas, the way ideas work in the mind. He understands something about the relationship of the conscious mind and the subconscious. We would talk at length at times about all of this, and I, I still remember those days quite fondly, and it causes me to think fondly of John Little now. He approached me intelligently, again, not on the assumption that I was psychotic, not knowing what psychosis even means, writing men's or off as a loony or a crazy. Mm -hmm. He knew that there was something going on in my soul that was very serious to me. And he, when we spoke, it was serious. There was no, nothing smug, not laughing at me. Not, he didn't, never thought I was necessarily even crazy. He, he was actually interested in the ideas. Some of the ideas were actually quite logical. The basic premise is for a way off. Thinking was actually quite sound on some of it. This is something I learned about later, too. A lot of people have used logic brilliantly, but their basic premises aren't in reality. Or they build castles in the cortex. Their ideas have very little bearing on reality. I was still studying, but this is the part that interests me the most. I was still studying philosophy. I understood what I was reading, understood the importance of being in control of one's mind. But there was a lot I didn't understand. There were forces at work in my subconscious that I, I literally did not have an explicit understanding of. As Ayn Rand points out, that which is not explicit is not in man's control. I didn't have an explicit understanding of what was going on, and therefore I did not have full control. My ex-girlfriend was quite supportive too, emotionally and financially. Most other people, from what I understand now, just wrote Mentor off as a great deal, was not understanding anything philosophically about what was going on. Just an opportunity, as John Little pointed out, to say, ha ha, we were not so bad. Mike Mentor wasn't that great anyway. So by bringing Mike Mentor down, they kind of elevated themselves in their own eyes. often laugh, mock, hear at things they don't understand. One thing that does disappoint me is the fact that there were so few people who seemingly made any sincere attempt to understand or extend any, any support just spiritually. 
I heard from almost, I heard from no one during that period. No one wrote me a letter, no one called. No one said, gee, I hope you're doing all right. Then again, with some people I understand, they, they, they didn't understand it. It was beyond their, their comprehension at the time. But that, that's what disappoints me a little bit. And again, it's reflective of our whole society. People really don't make an effort to understand it. But it's also true, people have their own life dramas going on, and everybody every day goes to things that are traumatic, stressful, and you have to deal with what Mike Messer was going through, I understand, in several cases, it's just too much for them. finally dawned on me that the phantasms I was pursuing were not real. Finally, the last institutionalization, I realized, hey, there's something wrong here. This is too much of this. There's something going on in my mind here that's not right. And I gave it a lot of thought and realized that all of that stuff contradicted everything else I had believed in for a long time, and that's what was right. Get back to what you knew before, Mike Minster. That emotional trauma you had with your father dying in the magazine and whatever else, along with the amphetamines, really did do something to your mind. And erase all of that and go back to what you did know for sure. I, I did that, and with, I was on to a almost immediate recovery. It was that full recognition that everything that started at a certain point in time up until that moment of reflection was literally not true. So I acted, I, I took that particular step. I, I acted on the conviction that none of that was true. I ripped it out of my mind. And that conviction was, was the turning point. I understand that very clearly now. Because I understand that very clearly, I can work more consciously to create the type of soul or character I want. I know how to intensify positive, rational, psychological process than material. I know how to, what I refer to as the nature or diminish the potency of the negative, irrational material. By taking a strong, positive, conscious, affirmative stand towards a certain mental content, we can be better assured that that will work in our mind for us in the future. When something, we find something negative in our focal awareness, we can also take an appropriate stand consciously to denature it, diminish its intensity, diminish its potency, help ensure that that same psychological material will not work in our minds with the same kind of intensity it has in hand. This is the way that an individual creates his own soul consciously. I can't say I'm glad it happened. I learned a few things, but as with the bodybuilding period of my life, I, if I could go back, of course, I wouldn't go do it again. So, I mean, does it bother you that people have got a, a, a distorted view of what happened or events or whatever? No. no. Nothing like that bothers me anymore. Mm. Nothing, absolutely nothing like that bothers me. Mm. The ones who really care to take the time to understand will see it for what it is, nothing mm. to cheer at. Mm. And those who don't care, who are only looking to lower somebody else so that they can feel better in their own right, mm. well, those people obviously shouldn't be of any concern. Mm. I was down at Gold Gym right away, seeing clients. I started my own personal training business, which started out quite slowly. I bring that up for those listeners who might be considering starting their own training business or who are having trouble now. I was quite surprised that it did start out very slow. I thought that with my visibility and name recognition, I'd move into that business and it would be a spectacular success right from the outset, but it was not. The first four or five months, I only had a few clients. I was on the verge of giving up when all of a sudden, it just started paying off for whatever reason. It started to flourish. 
Um, talking about your career today as an athletic trainer, uh, are you are you enjoying sharing your knowledge that you've obtained uh, over the years and sharing with other people and helping them build their bodies? Is it giving you a lot of personal satisfaction? Yes, it is. I competed for oh up to ten years, and uh, as you may know yourself, athletic training gets to be a little old as you get older yourself. Uh, but now I do enjoy sharing the knowledge that I acquired over the years of my own training with my clients, and uh, it's very, very satisfying. I've been quite happy with it now. Four years later, it's better still, in part as a result of my continuing my articles, Flex Muscle and Fitness, and also as a result of several top bodybuilders finally recognizing that heavy duty high intensity training not only works in theory or not only true in theory but that it works in practice people like Aaron Baker David Durth David Paul Lee Labrada and last but not least Dorian Yates prior to winning his first Mr. Olympia last year and since he's been very kind to give me a good deal of credit apparently he was motivated to start training as a result of having seen my photograph, having read my articles, bought and read my books. Not only was he inspired by the image of my physique, but he was brighter than the average bodybuilder. He came to understand the theory of high intensity training, recognized its validity, used it, and went on to win European, British championships, Knight of Champions, and now the 19th. 92 and 93 Mr. Olympias. Many, many people who may have been wary, skeptical, even openly hostile to the theory of high intensity training are now not so much so. They're saying, geez, maybe Mr. was right, or at least he was on to something. If it worked for Dorian Yates and he and Casey Theater and Ray Metzger, there has to be something to it. Mike, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, people out there who would like to improve their physiques and their bodies and would want to go to perhaps a trainer. But what, what should somebody look at when they are looking into getting a trainer? What are some of the yeah. qualifications maybe? Well, not necessarily his muscular development or even his uh, athletic appearance. It's actually very difficult. Presumably the person's going to the gym because he knows little or nothing about training. Uh, I think the only way to do it would be to assess his general intelligence level and listen as to how well he explains the principles of productive exercise as to whether or not he has a grasp of the principles of exercise. A couple of the a couple of things that I've run across and while, while I've been training is that people generally want either two types of ways to improve their body. They either want to get more muscle mass mm -hmm. or they want to become defined. Talk about a little bit about the different theories between gaining mass, All which right. you should do, and maybe if somebody just wants to remain lean and not really gain any, any mass. Good point. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are two, two types of basic training. You can train either for muscle mass or endurance, which tends to, to burn body fat and keep you lean. Um, for those who want to build muscle mass, the most important principle is that of intensity. The harder you train, the more weight you lift, the more you put into it, the more muscle you'll develop. Uh, and those who are looking to just remain lean and not develop muscle, perhaps tone themselves, uh, the intensity factor, the amount of weight they lift is not so important. They don't have to push themselves quite as hard. I had a standing policy as a young man of always looking for someone to admire, to look up to. That was, that was on the level of my sense of life, my preconceptual, emotionally integrated view of life. The, the, childhood equivalent of a mature rational philosophy. It just so happened my father was a heroic figure and through emotional associations uh, I came to admire and integrate people like my father, people who stood, who stood up for what they believed in, and a tremendous integrity and that's been my policy now explicitly, not on the level of emotional subconscious but on the explicit level of a conscious, mature, rational philosophy, I am a hero seeker. I was a much younger man in my mid-twenties. Back in the 1970s, I was in my literary period, reading <laughs> the classics and just about anything I could get my hands on, and 
Uh, by chance, I came across Atlas Shrugged in 1977. Read it more or less as a literary duty, enjoyed it, but was not overwhelmed by any of the philosophy. And then in 1980, I met a, a very impressive man, in fact, the most impressive individual I've ever met, a man here in Los Angeles named Rex Dante. Fairly well, well known in certain circles here in Los Angeles as a philosopher. And upon first meeting him, I recognized that he was the man of the highest mind I had ever met. And I asked him how he got like that, and he said, Ayn Rand. And I knew the name, and he suggested I pursue my readings of Ayn Rand beginning with The Fountainhead, which I did read. In fact, that would have been my second book, of course, having read Atlas Shrugged prior. And from there on, I went to her nonfiction works, including The Romantic Manifesto, which, interestingly enough, is my favorite of all her books, as I'm not truly an artist. And The Romantic Manifesto is her statement on art. The Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, and many others. Yes, I, I feel very fortunate to have lived in the time of Ayn Rand, and I've thought about that many times. Uh, I don't know where I'd be without objectivism, exactly. I, I was always intellectually oriented, but uh, there are a lot of people out there posing as intellectuals who don't impress me at all. In fact, uh, many intellectuals claim the title based on an anti-intellectual approach to the intellect, believe it or not. Nietzsche was the only other philosopher who stimulated me, and it was because of his sense of life. He had a marvelous feeling about the greatness of man, which he wrote to express explicitly, but never at the same high level that Ayn Rand was able to achieve. As soon as I began reading Ayn Rand seriously after my meeting with Rex Dante, uh, it didn't take long before I recognized quite clearly that she was beyond the pale, well beyond the pale, an epical genius, if you will. The reality we live in is the only reality there is. Things are what they are. Learn to use your mind to identify those things accurately and evaluate them. Don't turn your mind into a distorting agent. Don't use your mind to evade the facts of reality. Confront reality as it is, which is the principle of justice. A is A. Things are what they are. Nature, in order to be commanded, has to be obeyed. Part of nature is your own mind. It has an identity. Learn how to use it properly. To the extent that you do, you'll be happy and successful. To the extent that you evade that knowledge, you will be unhappy and unsuccessful. Without a doubt. This is a wonderful endeavor in and of itself. There's a lot of self-satisfaction to be derived from recognizing that you were able to discipline yourself and use a certain amount of knowledge to take yourself from point A to point C, take your body from being average or below average to whatever it ultimately might be. But if you were to look deep down inside of yourself, get honest. What you're really looking for, even a businessman, somebody who wants to make a lot of money, a million dollars, they do want the money, and that's fine and good. At bottom, the purpose of all goal achievement is to develop a sense of mastery, efficacy, to achieve a certain type of happiness that can only be had as a result of achieving goals. A lot of people find once they acquire the muscles they'd always dreamed of, they're not really different inside because they, they don't take this philosophical approach. The idea is to gain a sense of mastery, a sense of self-esteem, happiness, which can only be derived from achieving goals. You have to have that stated explicitly at the outset. If you think that you're gonna end up having those things only as a result of having the muscles, and you don't work on developing other aspects of your life along with it, like your philosophy, then you're just gonna end up with a set of muscles and be bereft of the rest. A lot of top bodybuilders, as top bodybuilders, of course, they have the big muscles, but they're self-arrested intellectually. They're no further ahead at the age of 30 or 40 mentally than they were 
10 or 15 years ago when they started. They're psychologically beset by the same conflicts, the same sense of insecurity, uncertainty, self-doubt. They've got the big muscles, but they didn't get that sense of mastery. Self-esteem can only be achieved by starting the whole process by stating explicitly, not only do I want big muscles, but I want self-confidence. I can only get that by enjoying the process, gaining the knowledge, recognizing that I am a more effective person. It's interesting, as gratifying as it is to receive emails, phone calls, letters every day from bodybuilders around the globe, thanking me for helping enlighten them with regards to a valid scientific approach to training. Much more gratifying is the overwhelming response that I've had the last several years from bodybuilders thanking me for introducing them to Ayn Rand, objectivism, and the <laughs> realm of the intellect.